This is Chapter Twenty Three of A Tramp Abroad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Tramp Abroad by Mark Twain. Chapter Twenty Three. Nicodemus Dodge and the Skeleton. We were satisfied that we could walk to Opanau in one day. Now that we were in practice, so we set out the next morning after breakfast, determined to do it. It was all the way downhill, and we had the loveliest summer weather for it. So we set the pedometer and then stretched away on an easy, regular stride down through the cloven forest, drawing in the fragrant breath of the morning in deep, refreshing draughts, and wishing we might never have anything to do forever but walk to Opanau and keep on doing it, and then doing it over again. Now, the true charm of pedestrianism does not lie in the walking or in the scenery, but in the talking. The walking is good to time the movement of the tongue by, and to keep the blood and the brain stirred up and active. The scenery and the woodsy smells are good to bear in upon a man an unconscious and unobtrusive charm and solace to eye and soul and sense. But the supreme pleasure comes from the talk. It is no matter whether one talks wisdom or nonsense, the case is the same. The bulk of the enjoyment lies in the wagging of the gladsome jaw and the flapping of the sympathetic ear. And what motley variety of subjects a couple of people will casually rake over in the course of a day's tramp! There being no constraint, a change of subject is always in order, and so a body is not likely to keep pegging at a single topic until it grows tiresome. We discussed everything we knew during the first fifteen or twenty minutes that morning, and then branched out into a glad, free, boundless realm of the things we were not certain about. Harris said that if the best writer in the world once got the slovenly habit of doubling up his halves, he could never get rid of it while he lived. That is to say, if a man gets the habit of saying, I should have liked to have known more about it, instead of saying simply and sensibly, I should have liked to know more about it, that man's disease is incurable. Harris said that his sort of lapse is to be found in every copy of every newspaper that has ever been printed in English, and in almost all of our books. He said he had observed it in Kirkham's Grammar and in Macaulay. Harris believed that milk-teeth are commoner in men's mouths than those doubled-up halves. Footnote 1. I do not know that there have not been moments in the course of the present session when I should have been very glad to have accepted the proposal of my noble friend, and to have exchanged parts in some of our evenings of work. From a speech of the English Chancellor of the Exchequer, August 1879. End of note 1. That changed the subject to dentistry. I said I believed the average man dreaded tooth-pulling more than amputation and that he would yell quicker under the former operation than he would under the latter. The philosopher Harris said that the average man would not yell in either case if he had an audience. Then he continued, When our brigade first went into camp on the Potomac, we used to be brought up standing occasionally by an ear-splitting howl of anguish. That meant that a soldier was getting a tooth pulled in a tent. But the surgeons soon changed that. They instituted open-air dentistry. There never was a howl afterward, that is, from the man who was having the tooth pulled. At the daily dental hour there would always be about five hundred soldiers gathered together in the neighborhood of that dental chair, waiting to see the performance and help, and the moment the surgeon took a grip on the candidate's tooth and began to lift, every one of those five hundred rascals would clap his hand to his jaw and begin to hop around on one leg and howl with all the lungs he had. It was enough to raise your hair to hear that variegated and enormous unanimous caterwaul burst out. With so big and so derisive an audience as that, a sufferer wouldn't emit a sound, though you pulled his head off. The surgeon said that pretty often a patient was compelled to laugh in the midst of his pangs, but that they had never caught one crying out after the open-air exhibition was instituted. Dental surgeons suggested doctors. Doctors suggested death. Death suggested skeletons. And so by a logical process the conversation melted out of one of these subjects and into the next, until the topic of skeletons raised up Nicodemus Dodge out of the deep grave in my memory where he had lain buried and forgotten for twenty-five years. When I was a boy in a printing office in Missouri, 
a loose-jointed, long-legged, tow-headed, jeans-clad, countrified cub of about sixteen, lounged in one day, and without removing his hands from the depths of his trousers' pockets, or taking off his faded ruin of a slouch hat, whose broken rim hung limp and ragged about his eyes and ears, like a bug-eaten cabbage-leaf, stared indifferently around, then leaned his hip against the editor's table, crossed his mighty brogans, aimed at a distant fly from a crevice in his upper teeth, laid him low, and said with composure, "'Where's the boss?' "'I am the boss,' said the editor, following this curious bit of architecture wonderingly along up to its clock face with his eye. "'Don't want anybody for to learn the business, tain't likely.' "'Well, I don't know. Would you like to learn it?' Pap's so poor he can't run me no more. So I want to get a show summers if I can. Tain't no diffus what. I'm strong and hearty, and I don't turn my back on no kind of work, hard nor soft. Do you think you would like to learn the printing business? Well, I don't really care a dern what I do learn, so as I get a chance for to make my way. I just as soon learn printing as anything. Can you read? Yes, middlin. Right. Well, I've seed people could lay over me thar. Cipher? Not good enough to keep store, I don't reckon, but up as fur as twelve times twelve I ain't no slouch. T'other side of that is what gets me. What is your home? I'm from old Shelby. What's your father's religious denomination? Him? Oh, uh, well, he's a blacksmith. No, no, I, I don't mean his trade. What's his religious denomination? Oh, I didn't understand you before. He's a Freemason. No, no, you, you don't get my meaning yet. What I mean is, does he belong to any church? Now you're talking. Couldn't make out what you was a-trying to get through your head. No way. Belong to a church. Why, boss, he's been the pisonous kind of free-will Baptist for forty years. There ain't no pisoner one than what he is. Mighty good man, Pap is. Everybody says that. If they said any different, they wouldn't say it where I was. Not much they wouldn't. What is your own religion? Well, boss, you kind of got me there. And yet you ain't got me so mighty much, nother. I think if a feller helps another feller when he's in trouble, and don't cuss, and don't do no mean things, nor nothing he ain't a, no business to do, and don't spell the Savior's name with a little G, he ain't running no risks. He's about as safe as he belonged to a church. But suppose he did spell it with a little g. What then? Well, if he done it a purpose, I reckon he wouldn't stand no chance. He oughtn't to have no chance anyway. I'm most rotten certain about that. What is your name? Nicodemus Dodge. I think maybe you'll do, Nicodemus. We'll give you a trial anyway. All right. When would you like to begin? Now. So within ten minutes after we had first glimpsed this nondescript, he was one of us, and with his coat off and hard at it. Beyond that end of our establishment, which was furthest from the street, was a deserted garden, pathless and thickly grown with the bloomy and villainous jimson weed and its common friend the stately sunflower. In the midst of this mournful spot was a decayed and aged little frame house with but one room, one window, and no ceiling. It had been a smoke-house a generation before. Nicodemus was given this lonely and ghostly den as a bedchamber. The village smarties recognized a treasure in Nicodemus right away, a butt to play jokes on. It was easy to see that he was inconceivably green and confiding. George Jones had the glory of perpetrating the first joke on him. He gave him a cigar with a firecracker in it and winked to the crowd to come. The thing exploded presently, and swept away the bulk of Nicodemus's eyebrows and eyelashes. He simply said, "'I consider them kind of cigars dangersome,' and seemed to suspect nothing. The next evening Nicodemus waylaid George and poured a bucket of ice-water over him. One day, while Nicodemus was in swimming, Tom McElroy tied his clothes. Nicodemus made a bonfire of Tom's by way of retaliation. A third joke was played upon Nicodemus a day or two later. He walked up the middle aisle of the village church Sunday night with a staring handbill pinned between his shoulders. The joker spent the remainder of the night after church in the cellar of a deserted house, and Nicodemus sat on the cellar door till toward breakfast time 
to make sure that the prisoner remembered that if any noise was made some rough treatment would be the consequence the cellar had two feet of stagnant water in it and was bottomed with six inches of soft mud but i wander from the point it was the subject of skeletons that brought this boy back to my recollection before a very long time had elapsed the village smarties began to feel an uncomfortable consciousness of not having made a very shining success out of their attempts on the simpleton from old shelby experimenters grew scarce and charry now the young doctor came to the rescue there was delight and applause when he proposed to scare nicodemus to death and explained how he was going to do it he had a noble new skeleton the skeleton of the late and only local celebrity jimmy finn the village drunkard a grisly piece of property which he had bought of jimmy finn himself at auction for fifty dollars under great competition when jimmy lay very sick in the tan yard a fortnight before his death the fifty dollars had gone promptly for whiskey and had considerably hurried up the change of ownership in the skeleton the doctor would put jimmy finn's skeleton in nicodemus's bed this was done about half past ten in the evening about nicodemus's usual bedtime midnight the village jokers came creeping stealthily through the jimpson weeds and sunflowers toward the lonely frame den they reached the window and peeped in there sat the long-legged pauper on his bed in a very short shirt and nothing more he was dangling his legs contentedly back and forth and wheezing the music of camp town races out of a paper overlaid comb which he was pressing against his mouth by him lay a new jew's harp a new top and solid india rubber ball a handful of painted marbles five pounds of store candy and a well-gnawed slab of gingerbread as big and as thick as a volume of sheet music he had sold the skeleton to a traveling quack for three dollars and was enjoying the result just as we had finished talking about skeletons and were drifting into the subject of fossils harris and i heard a shout and glanced up the steep hillside we saw men and women standing away up there looking frightened and there was a bulky object tumbling and floundering down the steep slope toward us we got out of the way and when the object landed in the road it proved to be a boy he had tripped and fallen and there was nothing for him to do but trust to luck and take what might come when one starts to roll down a place like that there is no stopping till the bottom is reached think of people farming on a slant which is so steep that the best you can say of it if you want to be fastidiously accurate is that it is a little steeper than a ladder and not quite so steep as a mansard roof but that is what they do some of the little farms on the hillside opposite heidelberg were stood up edgewise the boy was wonderfully jolted up, and his head was bleeding from cuts which he had got from small stones on the way. Harris and I gathered him up and set him on a stone, and by that time the men and women had scampered down and brought his cap. Men, women, and children flocked out from neighboring cottages and joined the crowd. The pale boy was petted and stared at and commiserated, and water was brought for him to drink and bathe his bruises in. And such another clatter of tongues! All who had seen the catastrophe were describing it at once, and each trying to talk louder than his neighbor. And one youth of a superior genius ran a little way up the hill, called attention, tripped, fell, and rolled down among us, and thus triumphantly showed exactly how the thing had been done. Harris and I were included in all the descriptions, how we were coming along, how Hans Gross shouted, how we looked up startled, how we saw Peter coming like a cannon shot how judiciously we got out of the way and let him come and with what presence of mind we picked him up and brushed him off and set him on a rock when the performance was over we were as much heroes as anybody else except peter and were so recognized we were taken with peter and the populace to peter's mother's cottage and there we ate bread and cheese and drank milk and beer with everybody and had a most sociable good time and when we left we had a handshake all around and were receiving and shouting back lieb wohl's until a turn in the road separated us from our cordial and kindly new friends forever we accomplished our undertaking at half past eight in the evening we stepped into Oppenau, just eleven hours and a half out of allerheiligen one hundred and forty-six miles this is the distance by pedometer the guide-book and the imperial ordnance maps make it only ten and a quarter a surprising blunder for these two authorities are usually singularly accurate in the matter of distances. 
End of chapter 23